I struggled getting a message this week, and that's unlike me. I mean, I've got heaps of messages, but I, I always try and get fresh manner, and I just couldn't put it together. And each day went by, and I thought, what's going on? Mm. It's just like, is it the devil? Is it this? So you, you go through the motions, you know, you do everything, you mm. plead the blood, you pray against the demonic, you do, still can't get a message. Kind of like, Lord, this is a critical, this week is critical. Mm. I don't know if you realize how critical. This is seven days until the new year. Wow. God's calendar. Right. This is the last Sunday in the old mm. calendar. That's right. So this is a critical day. So to me, I was, Lord, what is it that you want me to bring today? And um, I got it, and I, and I got it, I think, Thursday after spending a lot of time this week with the Lord over it. So I want to share it with you. And I know when you hear it, it's just going to sit with you. You know, no, this is God's right. And uh, in seven days, we're going to hit 577, seven, God's calendar. So what's happening currently in the spirit realm? This is what the Holy Spirit gave me. I haven't read this, haven't seen it on the internet. This is hot off the press, so follow it. See Test the spirit, the Bible says. So you see, but I know this is God. There is an assignment of angelic hosts. The Holy Spirit said to me, being a sign to bring an alignment in the church. And we've got seven days left for people to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. And then... What you're talking about is going to magnify and multiply mm. hugely. Mm. We're going to see things rapidly get worse. Yeah. So for us, we've got a week to deal with the garbage, if we've got any garbage. And I think this is a time that we need to really have a hard look this next seven days and deal with it. Um, and as I speak, I think it will come out what I'm talking about. There's one major issue the Holy Spirit said, one only, that God is doing right now. And it's this alignment in the church, and it's the same pattern that happened before Jesus started his public ministry. So I've got biblical basis. I've actually got more than two witnesses in the Bible to prove that this is biblical. It's the same pattern that happened to the early church it's the same pattern that happened to the Old Covenant Church. And it's the same pattern to make us usable as the Bride of Christ in this hour that's going to happen. For the Israelites to be protected and provided, they had to stay under God's covering, right? That's the cloud, that's the, the fire. And once they stepped outside of that cloud, that covering... They expose themselves to the enemy. And it's not possible for us to be under his protection in this hour to come or under his provision in this hour to come unless we get under the cloud. Mm -hmm. And that's the word the Holy Spirit gave me. Um, I actually headed it up, the cloud is coming. And as the Holy Spirit spoke to me on this, I got a picture of what Elijah told his servant that time on Mount Carmel, we'll go and have a look. Mm. The rain's coming. And the servant went and he looked and he came and said, no, I can't see a thing. Mm. Seven times. Important, seven times. Mm. On the seventh time he said, I can see a cloud as big as the size of a man's mm. fist or hand. And that's what the Holy Spirit says. The cloud's coming. Open your eyes and look for it. It's coming very, very soon. We need to get under that cloud. Because if we're not, we're going to have no protection in this hour. Um, I strongly advise to deal with anything with anyone that hasn't been dealt with. You can't change people, but you can change your side of it. In other words, leave your gift at the altar. We all know what I'm talking mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. Do your part. 
This is the last seven days before things you will see deteriorate. Psalm 91 says, He who dwells mm-hmm. under the... So I love the, the Amplified. I wrote this down this morning. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High mm-hmm. shall remain stable mm-hmm. and fixed. I love that word, mm-hmm. stable mm-hmm. and fixed. We all need to remain stable when the trials come, when the storms come. Mm-hmm. Uh, Stable and fixed under the shadow of the Almighty. And I'll say of the Lord, He is my refuge, my fortress, my God. On Him I will lean. That's what the Amplified says. It's kind of like the picture of Jesus with the disciples leaning on His breast. Mm -hmm. On Him I will lean in these times of trouble and rely in Him and trust Him. So the alignment that's happening currently is to bring us under the shadow. The only part we can do to make this happen is to deal with our own stuff. We cannot change others. Mm. It's only ourselves. So it, this is critical. Don't, don't procrastinate any longer with this. I believe there's a caption, and, and I'm saying seven days before we're going to see a shift. Um, for some, you know, it's not going to mean that it's going to pan out the way we want it to pan out. And the challenge here is the adjustment may not be how you expect it to be. Mm. Sometimes we have perceptions because of past teachings, etc. It's going to work out a certain way. Life's going to happen a certain way. And God's saying, no, I've got it all in hand. You've just got to trust me. Mm. Trust is a huge word that we need to grasp in this hour. For some it's going to mean brokenness because it's in our brokenness we become desperate enough to seek Him. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Hmm? So don't try and stop that if that's what's happening in someone's life. Mm. Don't interfere thinking I'm helping the person. Mm. <laughs> Allow God to bring that in that person's mm. life. Don't think it's the enemy. God may even use sickness. He doesn't put sickness on us. You all understand that. But he will allow things to happen. Why? Because it's in the sickness that we'll touch the hem of his Mm garment. There's some times that we just are so hard-headed we keep running to the doctor. Instead of touching the hem of his garment. You know what I'm saying? You know, I'm not saying get rid of medicine. You you hear what I'm saying? There comes a point where the doctor no longer can heal you. (laughs) And the hem of his garment looks a lot better. And it's that desperation that brings us to that place. So don't fight that. Don't try and... I mean, what's happening in our brother in in Africa, my prayer and my heart goes out. Terrible, terrible. But it's in those dark places God can speak and do great things. So praise the Lord in all things. Give thanks. Yeah. It may be for some in financial hardship. I've had the pleasure of watching someone within my own family go through this. And I say pleasure not in a sadistic sense, mm. because I knew the outcome. Mm. That, that, you know, we're, oh, we want to prop that person up and do everything to help them. And that's the worst thing we can do sometimes. Mm. Because God's working on that person's life Mm -hmm. and he's speaking into them and he's making those necessary adjustments. Mm -hmm. So sometimes in our rescuing people, we're actually harming them. And um, there's never been a time in our lives more important than now to trust the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God. We all know what that means. For the Israelites, living under his protection meant remaining under the cloud. It meant obedience to what he wanted of them. It meant fully trusting him even when they were under attack from the enemy. (laughs) And that's where the rubber meets the road. When the marriage is not too good or there's problems or there's financial hardships or the children are playing up or whatever. And it's in those times, those tests, that God is grooming us. Allow Him to groom you. I want to encourage you. Allow it. Don't, don't run from it. Don't hide from it. Don't say it's the devil. Yes. Allow Him yeah. to shape you in that time. Yeah. And I think of our dear brother in prison. 
and God is doing a great work Hallelujah. through him and on him. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yeah. Yes. And at the time, it may not seem like that. When you're in the midst of the storm, all you want to do is get out of it. What's happening? I want to get away. And God's saying, hey, I'm here. I'm right in the midst of this. Let's get the focus right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Praise the Lord. Uh, to hear the voice of the Father, Jesus had to stay close enough at all times because he could only do what he heard his Father say. He could only do what he saw his Father say. So if we get outside of the realm of the rod from the shepherd, we no longer hear the shepherd. Yeah, yeah. We're no longer within reach that he can say, come back here. Yeah. Yes. We need to stay close. close now. Bind us together, Lord. Yes. The song, it's true. It's a prophetic yes. statement. As a matter of fact, I don't like the song. But it's a prophetic <laughs> statement that, 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 that is so true. Stay knitted together, close together in this hour. Stay close when the boat's sinking. Stay close to the life raft. And the life raft is each other. Mm. It's Christ. We've got to stay knitted together in this hour. Jesus himself said, My sheep hear my voice. So, I'm just about finished. This is what came from the Holy Spirit. When Jesus was baptized in water, we're told that the heavens opened. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit came down in the form of a dove and it rested upon his shoulder. Mm. And you know, I had a look in Isaiah 64, I think it is. Mm. And Isaiah says, rend the heavens. Mm. And I looked up that word rend in the Hebrew and it means tear it apart. Mm. God tore apart the heavens to allow an open heaven from him down to his son. So when we talk about Oh, but it's different now. We're in a new covenant. The Holy Spirit's within us. No, no, no. It, it, it. What Jesus had was the Holy Spirit upon him and in him. And there is a difference. We have the Holy Spirit within us. What we're moving into is we will also have the Holy Spirit rest upon us if we allow it. And this is where I'm going to take you today. Yeah. This is what this open heaven is all about. This is what we need to stay under, if you like, the open heaven or the cloud in this season. Because it's in that is our protection. It's in that is our provision. Mm. It's in that we can hear. If you can imagine the heaven is open and we're standing under it, we can hear directly what God is saying. So when we step outside of that, mm. let us get into this because I know this is a, it's probably a message that, that, that is a little bit different each one of us are living under this open heaven to some degree. To some degree. But we need to knit together and start hearing what God is saying through whomever he's saying. And it may not just be me. It may be you. It may be you, Mike. It may be you. It could be any of us that God is speaking to. But stay close to the one God is speaking to. Oh. Yeah, I mean. Because... That's where your covering will come from, and I'll prove it as scripture shortly. Once we step outside of the covering, there is no protection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, literally, the presence of God overshadowed Jesus. Just like, a, like, like the Israelites had the cloud, Jesus had the cloud of God, if you like. The covering mm -hmm. overshadowed. And Jesus was so sensitive to the presence of God on him, he knew when someone touched him. Now, none of us have got to that place, let's be honest. <laughs> uh, you're in a crowd, someone touches you and you go, who touched me? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> wow. So, let's get out of the natural thinking here because it's not talking about a physical touch. There is a withdrawal happening here. Mm. Something is being taken from the Master. And that's the place where you're coming into in this season. Where you will feel 
the presence of God be released from you. Yeah. Where, 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 wherever you go, like Elijah, you will take that presence with you if you stay under his covering. Yeah. And it will affect those who are around you. So I'm not talking about the indwelling of the Holy Ghost and thank God for that. Otherwise, none of us would be here. But on the day of Pentecost, there was a visible presence in the room of God. Mm. The Bible says there was cloven tongues as a fire that sat upon them. There was a visible presence of God that they took outside of that room into the city. Peter carried this presence. He was aware of it. The Bible tells us when he went into the streets that people would come from all over just to get under his shadow. Not to get hands laid on him. Mm -hmm. Not to get the scriptures spoken over him. Mm -hmm. Just his shadow. We're talking about a tangible presence of God here. Mm -hmm. See, in this hour, all the good preaching goes out the door. All the good music goes out the door. Mm -hmm. This is about the presence of God. We're coming into the season of God. The season of man is over. This is the season of God. And wherever God goes, God impacts. And it's not with fancy words. And it's not with fancy buildings. It's with presence. It's with power. It's tangible. It's something that you tangibly can feel. Tangibly will change people's lives. This is what we've been waiting for for 2,000 years. This is it. This is what the early church had a taste of, but the Bible tells us the glory of the latter will be greater than the glory of the former. What what did they have? They had the glory of God upon them. We've had the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. Thank God for that. But the glory of God is coming. And the Bible tells us it will be seen throughout the whole earth. Amen. Amen. Awesome times we're coming into. Yes. Amen. We know shadows don't have any substance. Mm. <laughs> there's no substance with the shadow of your foot. I can see it there. But there's no substance with it. So it's not, this has nothing to do with the physical being. This is mm. to do with the presence of God. I believe that those early disciples, that the presence of God that was upon them was because that Jesus was near them and it overshadowed them. That's what I believe. Mm. We can see this in the Old Covenant with Moses. How many million Israelites? Mm. And one man is carrying the presence of God Mm. and it overshadowed a lot of them. Protected a lot of them until they got into rebellion. When Moses got close to God on Mount Sinai, his face shone with the manifest presence of God. So much so that people couldn't look at him. We know all these stories and they sound great stories, but this is what the church has been waiting for. This is what the church has been lacking. We have tried everything. Let's be honest. Uh, yeah. The church has tried everything. They've tried to do it so many different ways and better and, and better than the world and that. And, and, and the truth is none of it has worked the way it did in the early church. None of it has worked the way it did when they were crossing that desert. Mm-hmm. And this is what we're coming into. And the tangible presence of God can be transferred through being close to whoever is caring. I remember the stories of Smith Wigglesworth. But God allowed a taste of this in his life. That he could walk onto a railway station into a rail carriage and the people would fall down under the presence of God and feel the conviction of God upon them. Unbelievers. This is what's necessary in the South for the great harvest. Yeah. See, it's not us who are going to bring the harvest on. It's God and it's His way. It's not our way. And there's nothing we can do other than obey Him and get our lives so right and so under that cloud that we then become usable in the South. Yeah. Mm. Amen. Haggai 2, the glory of the latter house will be greater. It's the glory each of us need. It's the glory we need. Mm. Don't be content with what you've got at the moment. 
I'm not content. And I, now, I know the Bible says be content. Paul was content in every situation. I don't mean it in that sense. I'm not content with where I'm at spiritually. Amen. Mm. Amen. That's the truth. I mean, if, if we're going to be honest enough, hey, I want to be like Peter was. I want to be like Paul was. I want to be like Moses was. God is no respecter of people. If we cry out hard enough yeah. for it, God, you did it for them. Yeah, I mean. Huh? Mm-hmm. You're no respecter just because you're, his name's Amen. Moses. Mm-hmm. Hey, my name's Martin. Yeah. I'm your son. Yes. Amen. No, it's not obnoxious. It's the truth because God oh, wants yeah. His glory to go across the whole. He wants yeah. carriers of His presence Amen. and glory. Yeah. So we've got to start to hunger, hunger and fight for this yes. in the spirit realm. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And it's the glory that rested upon Peter. And this was the shadow that changed everything in wherever he went. This is what changed lives. This is what healed the lepers. This is what yeah. got those cripples off the ground. Was yeah. the shadow. God's presence, His glory just flooding onto those people. Yeah. It wasn't some great message. We've had all the best messages. Come on. The church has preached the best in the West. Yeah. What's it done? Not enough. It hasn't changed the world. True. But Jesus changed the world, just his presence. Peter, when he walked in the streets, changed the whole city. And that's what we're coming into. My shadow will only release what overshadows me. That's a profound statement. My shadow will only release what overshadows me. Is it depression? That's what I will admit. Depression. Yeah. <laughs> Is it unforgiveness? That's what's going to come out from me. I have got to be clean in order to admit the presence of glory of God. Don't allow past failures, unbelief, worry, whatever, unforgiveness. Don't allow any of that to stop you in this hour yes. for what God has for yeah. you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because all of these things will turn your focus back onto yourself. And that's what makes us Mm self-centered. When we're so caught up with our whatever. Mm. Even our sickness. You know, we've gone through a stage in the church where a lot of churches even denied sickness. Denied that you had a broken leg, Mike, or whatever. Mm. No, God doesn't want us to deny truth. Mm. But He doesn't want us to get so focused on that problem Amen. that it consumes us and then we buy into it. Amen. Each of us have got our own issues. Let's be honest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hmm? We don't need to you know, have a test to see who's got the worst affliction. <laughs> but some of us have got some serious stuff going down here. Nevertheless, let's focus on Him in this world. Yeah. <laughs> because when His glory comes, that baby's going to go straight out of you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're, yeah. you're not going to need to hold on to that anymore. Yeah. That'll be gone. We don't have to talk about that. Yeah. We don't have to focus on that. Yeah. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now I'm speaking from a position of someone who is battling myself. <laughs> So, you know, this is not a faith statement. This is the way we've got to live yes. because I am waiting to, when that glory cloud opens, bang, that, that thing goes. <laughs> Amen? Amen. 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 <laughs> uh, be occupied with Him. Amen. He is the key to living under the shadow. Yes, He is. Don't be occupied with self. Amen. That means stay close enough to Him. Mm. Oh. Stay close enough to Him at all times. Please allow whatever problem you're going through to focus you onto Him. The worse the problem that is afflicting you, the greater the reason you should be focusing on Him. Mm. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. The greater the reason you should be focusing on Him. Because it's when we're drowning we need the lifeline the most. Isn't that true? Yes, it is. Do not waste the opportunity He's given you. I look around and I I look into our uh, our group and I think there's a lot of us that have been getting hit and God's making some adjustments. 
<laughs> God's, God's allowing some adjustments yes. because when these, these things come upon us, it's a test. We won't say where they come from. It's not necessary. It's irrelevant. What's relevant is He is greater yes. than yes. the problem. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> he is greater. Yes. Uh, and see, when you're under that shadow, when I'm under that shadow, many of the ones are going to come and stay under the shadow with you. Mm. That's true. Mm. Many are going to want to come. Mm. You're not going to have to put a sign out. Mm. <laughs> you are the sign. Hey, <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> Wherever you go, it will emanate the presence of God. Mm. You become the walking sign. Mm. <laughs> not the building. Not the good music. And then, Paul carried this presence in his ministry and to top up his need, his financial need, he's making tents and even the very tents that he's sewing are being used, chopped up to send out so people will get healed. Can you imagine that? Just his work, the presence of God is upon his work that they give out pieces of the tent, mm -hmm. they give out his handkerchiefs, they give out wh whatever he touches becomes tangible for the presence of God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is the God we serve. Yeah. This is the God that in this hour is going to turn it up. And he's going to display his glory in the whole earth. Amen. And this is the way he's going to do it, through you. Mm. Through you. Amen. I don't know about you, but I want this. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus modeled it. Peter modeled it. Yeah. And I hold out believing that it's coming soon. And we will walk in this. Mm. And that's why my focus over the last few weeks has been on dealing with issues, discouragement and unforgiveness and whatever. Mm. Just clean the slate, clean the table for what's coming. Mm -hmm. There's got to be a dissatisfaction within you, each of you, to hunger for this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. I am not satisfied Amen. until I have this. Amen. <laughs> the early church revival happened because of God's glory. When I say the early church, I'm talking in the Old Covenant. Mm -hmm. The early church happened because of God's glory in the New Covenant. The, the, the church in this hour, the real church, will rise up because of God's glory. Mm -hmm. This is the bride of Christ. Mm -hmm. Great times with. Paul said in Second Corinthians chapter six, verse eleven to eighteen, he said, "You are restricted by your affections, mm -hmm. those things that run contrary to the word of God." By your effect. It's a great scripture. Mm. We are restricted by our affections. Whatever we give our affection to is what restricts us. Yes. That's why it's not good to give your affection to sickness, even if you're sick. Mm. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> or poverty or lack, mm. or whatever. Give your affection to him, to his word. And those things, as the song says, will become strangely dim. I love that song. Turn your eyes upon them. Mm. Yeah. Those problems dissipate. Mm. Do they go away? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Mm -hmm. That's up to him. But the glory can make them go away. Yeah, <laughs> Each day will bring its own challenges and possibly none is greater than this and it's not allowing what we are familiar with to determine our destiny. Amen. This is actually my message. Don't allow what you're familiar with to determine your destiny. Mm. We must break out of familiarity. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Now I've got to throw something in here that's not in my message. The Holy Spirit is saying, Sometimes we become familiar because of past problems in our upbringing, hurts, whatever, 
So we guard ourselves by doing things in a certain way. Mm -hmm. We create familiarity. That will block the Holy Spirit from living. Mm -hmm. Don't allow those things. In other words, don't try and control. Get rid of the control. Yeah. Control is the worst problem in this universe. It was the first sin, it's going to be the last sin. Man tried to control what God said, trust me. Mm. Jesus completed his endurance test in the desert 40 days. And then he shares with his first audience in that small synagogue in a place called Nazareth. Probably 50, 60 people stand, sitting there listening to the carpenter's son that they all knew. They knew him. And he had just come out of the desert absolutely pumped, if I can use that word, <laughs> with the glory of God. Why? Because see, the glory of God had rested upon him when he was baptized, and then it was tested in the desert. Mm. Each one of you is going to encounter some tests in the next so many weeks. When the presence of God will fall, you will be tested because the enemy will try and make you trip. Because he knows the danger that you are at that time. At the moment, you're not too dangerous. <laughs> when you're carrying the glory of God, you're dangerous. Amen. And the enemy realizes that. And so he attacked Jesus in the desert. Yeah. And he has a crack at him and he tries everything. And Jesus, of course, passes the test. And he comes out. And the presence of God is upon him. And he comes to the temple. We're going to read it. I wasn't going to look for. We all know it. But this is a message that I know the Lord has told me that we need. Look for in verse 1. Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan. And he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days he ate nothing, and afterward when they had ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread, mm -hmm. etc. Jesus said, It's written. Mm -hmm. And then we go down. We won't read every bit of it. Verse 8, And Jesus answered him and said, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Mm -hmm. Now, let's go to verse 18. Jesus has just come out of the desert here, and he's standing before this audience, and he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon mm -hmm. me. Notice the word upon. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. If you want to know what Jesus had that you don't have, it was the glory of God upon him. Mm -hmm. This is what Peter had that we don't have at the moment. This is what Paul had that was so tangible that when he touched something, it left the presence of God infused into it. Because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he's sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, set at liberty those that are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable of the ear of the Lord. Now, that's normally where we stop. This is where I'm going to pack it up. And then he sat down, he closed the book, and he gave it back to the attendant. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. Mm. And at this stage, they're really happy with what they've just heard. Because they haven't connected what he just said. <laughs> they are not spiritually awakened to what he just told them. And then he went on and he said to them, verse 21, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And things go bad for me. <laughs> So all who bore witness to him and marveled at his gracious words, which proceeded out of his mouth, 
And they said, is this not Joseph's son? Okay, so up till here, it's not looking too bad. It's like Jesus has got through it. Verse 23, and he says to them, you will surely say this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have heard done in Capernaum, do here in your own country. Whoops. Assuredly, I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. And I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heaven was shut up three years and six months. Interesting, three and a half years. Isn't it? Mm-hmm. And there was a great famine throughout all the land. Interesting statement again. I believe it's prophetic. Mm-hmm. What's coming? But to none of them was Elijah sent except one, the woman at Zarephath. Sometimes we read over things without giving enough consideration to this. There is a whole town of people, a lot of widows in it. God has only sent Elijah to one person. Now, God is no respecter of people. Yeah. So we've got to understand that something is going on here. Verse 27, and many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet. None of them were cleansed except Nahum Mm. the Syrian. Mm. Mm. So all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. They rose up and they thrust them out into the Siletim, to the brow of the hill. In other words, they wanted to try and kill them. And, you know, it sounded, it started off pretty good. And then they got peeved off, excuse my language, Mm -hmm. because Jesus told them the truth. And what I can extract from the story is this. There is a time when a person is ready to receive from the Lord. Sometimes we think we need to go and talk to everyone now. But I want to suggest that not everyone's ready to receive now. Yeah, correct. These people were not ready to receive this day. Mm. And this is where we miss it sometimes as Christians. We push ahead of God, thinking we're doing the work of God, Mm. and we actually will cause offense. Mm. Now, Jesus didn't push ahead of God here. You'll see what he was doing. There is a motive in what he did. But he knew the outcome before he stood before them. Mm. We've got to be careful sometimes, even with our own children, we try and bring them back into the fold too quickly. Mm-hmm. When God said, I haven't finished with them yet. Yeah. Just keep praying and trusting. Mm-hmm. Huh? Mm-hmm. There's a right time when someone's ready to receive from the Lord. And circumstances is often what makes it the right time. Jesus uses two examples in this narrative. He, which upsets them. The first one is, is is Elijah, to get his point across. You know, to believe that God would visit anyone other than them was sacrilege. That's mm. <laughs> they've got a real problem. With this. <laughs> you would remember that both of these people, the woman at Zarephath and Nahum, are not mm. part of the fold. They're like the outcasts. They're the people we stone, mm. we hate. And here's Jesus talking that only they received. I don't think they were Jewish either. There we go. So the belief that God would visit them upset them. It's a hard pill to swallow. The piousness that we are okay and know more than the word of God who was Jesus was evident here. Mm. Jesus starts his narrative and he uses the story of Elijah at the woman of Zarephath. Elijah, a prophet that did hear from God, because there's a lot of prophets in those days and today that don't hear from God. They think they're hearing from God and they're not. Elijah did hear from God and he lived under the shadow that I'm talking about. And I believe Elijah was possibly the best person in the nation to stay close to at the time. You've got to be selective. Yeah. It's not about the size of the church yeah. or the synagogue yeah. or the crowd. 
Israel's in the midst of a famine that God had allowed to get the attention of his people. God had allowed this famine. Mm. Matter of fact, Elijah is the orchestrator of this. He's the one used to orchestrate this. And this woman's problems are complicated more than a lot of others because of her situation. Number one, she's a widow. Her husband has died. He is the provider. Their business is olive trees and, and, and a wheat field. That's what they've got for their business. She's got a child. She can't run the business. I've seen this so many times in Asia where the husband dies. And the woman is left with her child. To complicate this more, there's a famine. There's no rain. The olive trees have died. The wheat's dried up. There's nothing. She's got the reserves, whatever's left over here. She's in a desperate situation. And I believe desperation is what brings us closer to God. I believe that's why this particular woman was the only one that God visited. She was desperate. Oh, many would have been complaining about the problem. But she was desperate enough. Now, what's interesting with this woman is it seems she's already been groomed to know about God. Mm -hmm. She's already heard the message of the Hebrew. Mm -hmm. She's open Mm -hmm. to it. Mm -hmm. See, when you're desperate, you're more open to it. God knew it. So this small town of Zarephath in the province of Zidon, Zidon was actually where where Jezebel comes from, if you remember. Mm -hmm. This is is where she comes, this is where she originates from. Mm -hmm. And so Elijah goes, the woman who's after him to kill him, he goes and hides out in her town. (laughs) It's quite bizarre, isn't it? Somehow this woman's already been exposed to the faith and Elijah arrives at a place, and the Zidonians will worship as a Baal, by the way. Mm-hmm. And uh, this woman's left with her son, and no, no means to support. And uh, yeah, I, I can relate to this to some degree, but not to this extent where you just have to rely on the final option. And she's heard about this prophet, and this is. The final option. Like the woman with the issue of blood, the final option is this guy come into town. If I can just touch him. That's the last stop. There's no more stops. And she's at this place. So you can see why God allows people to be hungry. Why he allows why he allows this stuff. That the Western church for so long has tried to stop. And I believe withstood as a roadblock to a lot of what God is trying to do. Mm. Prosperity. Does God heal? Yes. Mm. Does he prosper? Yes. Yes. But does he want that to happen to you Mm. today? That's between him and you. (laughs) There's a reason why he allows things. Mm. Now the same one that brought the problems, Elijah, turns out to become the solution to her problem. Mm. And he's the only one who's not affected of what's going down. <laughs> That's a good place to be in. It's a famine, everything's gone bad, and you're okay. <laughs> That's a great place to be, and I laugh about that. Elijah's the only one that this famine is not affecting. Because yeah. <laughs> he's got an open heaven. Mm-hmm. That's the place we all got to be in in this era. We have to be in this place. Sure. Sure. <laughs> and I think it's funny. Yeah. <laughs> Not because I like seeing people suffer, but because they will want what I've got. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The deal is simple. Elijah wants bed and breakfast. <laughs> yeah, that's what he's after. And she wants food and ultimately healing for a boy. It's a good deal. <laughs> God already knows this. It's already sorted out before Elijah even turns up. The boy's not even sick at this time. But God knows what she needs, and God knows what Elijah needs. And so Elijah said, hey, you give me bed and breakfast, huh? it's all good for you. And that's how God works. Yeah. Stay yeah. close to the one who's under the shadow and get under it yourself. And then people will stay close to you. Because you've got the shadow of a shadow in you. Mm. 
And like mm. the woman with the issue of blood, this woman also had run out of options. She is relinquishing her control and out of her life. And that's the hardest thing for any human being to do, to give up control. <laughs> True? Yeah. Hardest thing to do? Yeah. Hardest thing to do? Hardest thing for a parent is to give up control of the children. Mm-hmm. As a child gets older, it's something we've had to work through in our lives. As they get older, you've got to let the reins go. Mm-hmm. You allow that child to fall down and make mistakes. Huh? Mm-hmm. Isn't it true? Mm-hmm. Yes. That's not on my notes. That's just... <laughs> so <I'm trying. laughs> We have to allow even each other to yeah. fall down sometimes yes. and make mistakes. Control is the most difficult thing to let go. Mm. And sometimes we are driven to desperation before we're willing to do it. Mm. 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 I pray God that we don't have to go to that place in the cell. Because we may not have that opportunity again. Mm. Relinquish control now. Why is it God only had Elijah minister to her? Only this widow. Because there must have been so many. The Bible tells us there would have been many widows. Mm. 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 It would seem that she's cried out to God and God's heard her cry. Desperation is a way of singling out those who mean business with God. And I believe every single one of us have to come to a place of desperation in our walk with God. Where Mm. every area of our life is laid at the foot of the Mm. cross. Be it finance, be it our health, our marriage, our children. And whilst Mm. we're holding on to control of any of those areas, we can't carry the presence of God Mm. because there's a deficiency. Mm. It's something we've all got to work through and quickly. Mm. Psalm 34 verse 18, the Lord is close to the broken heart. Always remember that. Mm. James 4 verse 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Mm. Mm. One thing I've learned, and some of you are years older than me, but I've learned just to be real to God. Mm. If I'm feeling like, say the word. <laughs> I'll tell God how yeah, I feel. Yeah. He's big enough to hear it. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. We don't have to pretend. We yeah. just be real. Yeah. The other person Jesus mentions is Nahum the Syrian <laughs> and, and, and the second person in Jesus' narrative is a soldier. Uh, Nahum who was sick and he's got leprosy and Nahum is a general in the Syrian army. Interesting story again. Mm-hmm. And second only to the king at that time of Damascus, whose wife had a Jewish servant girl, and she said, there's a guy out there, he's a Jewish prophet, and um, this guy might be able to help you if you can tap into him. So God uses a servant girl to talk to Naaman, Naaman. And the challenge for him is a willingness to humble himself. Because when you're in a position of authority and power, often Mm. that's really difficult to do. Mm. Especially when the prophet tells you to go and dip in a muddy river. (laughs) (laughs) You've kind of got a problem. (laughs) And Ron Nahum had this deal going where he wasn't too pleased with the (laughs) prophet, who wouldn't even give him time to talk to him. Mm. You know, I'm the general. You're telling me to go and get into this dirty river, and I'm a general, and uh, God is testing or allowing Nahum to go through this. Why? Because he wants to see if he's willing to humble himself. Mm -hmm. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. He will exalt you. Mm -hmm. And God wanted to exalt Nahum again. Mm -hmm. So Nahum, as we know, it all works out good for him. But Elijah is the disciple Elisha, sorry, is the disciple of Elijah, who was the prophet at this time. Elisha stayed under the mantle or the glory or the cloud that Elijah himself was carrying. You can see how God works. He selects people that he can trust, that he has seen 
in that private place. Not so many seen in public, but in that private place he can trust to impart his mantle on him. Mm. Mm. God gave Nahum so much favor in winning a lot of battles. So why God healed Nahum, I'm not sure, but it would seem that Nahum had favor from God, which is an indication to me that he's got a belief in this God. Mm. Um, Elisha is, is credited in the Word of God with doing twice as many miracles as Elijah. Mm. We can say that's because God gave him a double portion. I, I don't actually know if that's the reason. Um, but anyway, just like the woman of Zarephath, Nahum was desperately in need of help. Desperation seems to be the factor that gave them both faith to go after what they needed. Mm. Desperation. I think of our brother once again who went through some hardship the other week. You know who I'm talking about. Yeah. Things didn't work out the way he expected them. But God sees things we don't see. Mm. Mm. And God knows how he needs to adjust that person. Everyone's mm. different, wired differently, and only God knows how mm. to correct that faulty wiring. Notice God uses methods that are not normal. <laughs> In both of these cases, <laughs> that's the way God works. We we like to package him in our box, you know. Yeah. God works differently than the way that we think he should work. Unfamiliar ways. Yeah. And this was the problem at Nazareth that day that it wasn't it didn't fit into their box. It didn't fit into the way they thought it should happen. Rationale and reason, which is the devil's playground. He that's where he plays in our, in our minds and our reason. Stop revival that day. Just stopped it like that. Amazing the power of the mind, the rationale that can stop the power of God from causing revival in the city. Mm. It gives you an idea of the power mm. God has entrusted you and me. Our minds have to be disciplined to his word and to hear him. And so what stopped those listening from receiving was allowing what they knew in the natural realm to get in the way. Isn't he just as the carpenter's son? God's going to use some people that you probably think he shouldn't be using. <laughs> and it might shake you up a bit. <laughs> and uh, he's going to do some things differently in this hour that each one of us are going to say, is that really God? Mm -hmm. Because that's the way he works. Sure. Just to break us free from our minds so we don't think we're in control. Mm -hmm. And Jesus could do no mighty works in that town because of their familiarity mm. with him. That's what mm. caused the unbelief. Mm. Mm. Poverty of heart comes from familiarity. And the question today I have, what have you become familiar with? Mm. Yeah. What do you take for granted? Is it your family? You take for granted that mine? Mm. No, they're not. Is it your home? Your job? your husband, your wife. None of it belongs to you or me. Don't become familiar with it. Thank God every day for what he's given you. Yeah. Because he is in control of your life. He is in control of your wife's life, your husband's life. And at any time he can remove that. Mm -hmm. Never take for granted. Never become so familiar that, oh, I've been married 23 years. It used to be great and now it's... Never become familiar with it like that. Yeah. Always thank God like it's the first day of your life. For mm. that person. Always thank God that you were born again and that you were saved. 
Yeah. From yeah. 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 Never take for granted anything. You have no rights, I have no rights. God always works outside of the realm of the natural, and that's what makes him supernatural. Mm. We've got to adjust our finite minds to his infinite thinking, which is into another realm that we don't see. And the closer we become to him, the more we will see in that realm. Mm. Elijah could see into that realm what the natural eye could not see. Mm. Mm. Nazareth could not accept the truth who was Jesus because they allowed what they knew to be more real than the word of mm. truth. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Scary stuff. Mm. Familiarity can breed contentment. It's a great English saying. Sorry, Mike, it's not American. <laughs> <laughs> and when you're content, you stop hungering after God. Yeah, that's right. Never be content. Mm. There's always more. <laughs> There's always more. Mm. I can read the same scripture every day and it just keeps feeding me. There's mm. always more to come mm. out of the Word of God. And hunger is what sustains humility always. Pride always comes before a fall. Mm. Another great English saying. Mm. Pride comes before a fall. That's in the yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We've got to get that. Pride comes before the fall. In other words, pride enters in before we Mm. get into trouble. Mm. So taking things for granted causes us to lose value of what's been given to us. We've all done it, we all do it, and we all need to repent for it. Mm. And you lose the desire in a relationship when you stop investing in that. That applies to our children, that applies to our husband, our wife, our parents, our relatives, whatever, our siblings, Mm. our friends, and most of all it applies to God. When we stop investing in that relationship, you lose the desire. The challenge for all of us is to stay hungry while you're seated at the banqueting table. Mm. Mm. That's a challenge. When you know that everything is before you and to remain hungry. Mm. You can have anything on that table. But sometimes what's on the table can be the trap. Because Hunger is the most important thing for a Christian, to stay hungry. Hungry for his presence, hungry for him. Mm. In the natural, you get hungry when you don't eat, but in the spiritual, you get hungry when you do eat. Mm. The more you eat, the more hungry you get. Mm. Someone said to me just recently, I have no idea how you can spend so much time in God's Word. I said, I wish God gave more time in the day. There's not enough time. Mm -hmm. The same person who God is actually working on currently in their life said, I get bored with that. Maybe that's an adjustment that needs to happen in that Christian's life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In the Beatitudes, I'm going to close, Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Poor in spirit means being in a constant state of dependence on him. That's what it actually means. Mm. Being in a constant state of dependence upon him. And when we're dependent on him, it makes me vulnerable to him. And when you're vulnerable, you're in a place to hear his voice. Mm. Mm. 
to revisit some of these statements. Yeah. Mm. Being dependent on him makes you vulnerable to him. And when you're vulnerable, you're in a place to hear his voice. Nazareth was positioned that day for citywide revival when Jesus spoke those words, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Mm. I'm waiting to see the same happen in this nation and other nations of the world. Mm. When the Spirit of the Lord, when that open heaven opens, mm. when the cloud appears, and people are going to be given the same option, mm. the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. But instead their logic, their reason would not submit to the Spirit of God. <laughs> Hebrews 11.3 says, For by faith mm. the worlds were formed. Mm. Yes. And that's a powerful statement because faith comes before reason always. Sometimes we try and work out God or work out a situation through reason but that's not the way God did anything. God created faith first. Faith has to come before our mind. That's hard because that goes against the way we think. Mm. That makes us vulnerable. Mm. Faith makes you vulnerable. Makes me vulnerable. Because faith cannot reason. Faith actually goes against reason. And that's the trouble with those who are very educated. They have a trouble because reasoning becomes their guide, mm. their leader. Yeah. That makes sense. I've seen this on the mission field over the years. Those who are the least educated are the most easy to accept Christ, are the most easy to receive a healing. It doesn't matter how severe the miracle is they need. That's why you see it's prolific. Mm. The more hardship, the, the, the worse the situation, the more vulnerable that person seems mm. to become. Mm. Reason goes out the door. There is no such thing there. Reason's always got to submit to the word of faith. Nazareth lost their opportunity because familiarity breeds unbelief always. What they should have done was believe what was given to them and used it to develop more faith that day. For faith to increase, we have to use what we were last given. We cannot increase our faith until we use what's been given to us already. Use what God has given you today and plant it. And if you can't plant it in someone's life, plant it by prophesying. Mm. Declare it. Speak it into the existence. We must speak over this nation, over mm. people's lives, over our family. Declaration is very important in this hour. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Speak what God has given you. Declare it. Mm. God does not give increase. He won't give increase until we use what he's given because it's a waste. Notice when Jesus fed the 5,000 men how many women? Mm. He creates this abundance of food out of nothing. Mm. But he doesn't waste what's left over. <laughs> he collects it all up again. And I believe that's the same with faith. If we don't use it, we lose it. Mm. It's removed from us. Mm. Mm. Hunger, hunger, hunger. My goodness, I've got so much here that I could talk about. I'm going to... I love the story of Oliver Twist. Another great story. Great for you Americans. Oliver is an orphan boy that's scooped up off the streets, lives in an orphanage. And in the heart of England those days, they would feed them porridge for breakfast. Some of you still eat that terrible stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I felt that wave of... <laughs> I'm outnumbered here, I'm sorry. Yes, you are. <laughs> and they sit at those long tables and they have their bowl and a <laughs> scoop of this <laughs> stuff. Porridge. Yes, <laughs> porridge. <laughs> yeah. I think you call it rolled oats. Yeah. For oatmeal? Yeah, oatmeal. yeah. yeah. okay. 
whatever. That's, that stuff. <laughs> that gets stuck in your teeth if you've got <laughs> teeth. <laughs> and Oliver would sit at the table and in the movie, Oliver calls out and he says, please, sir, can I have some more? And that's like so many Christians. We want to eat more when our bowl's not empty. We need to empty the bowl first mm. before we ask for more. <laughs> uh? <laughs> and, uh, you know, the religious leaders in Jesus' day, they didn't know who he was, but the prostitutes knew who he was. Mm. That's mm. amazing when you think about mm. it. The thieves knew who he was. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Because yeah. many of the religious were not conscious they had a need. And that's the problem. Yes. It's going to be the same at his second coming. Oh. Yes. How much of the church of Jesus Christ does not recognize they have a need right at the no. moment? Right. Let's not be found wanting in this hour. God forbid we develop callous heart like they did at Nazareth that day. And let's recognize that we have a need every day of our life. Number one, to thank him for what he's given us. Yeah. And never take anything for granted. And number two, let's thank him for being him, mm. for who he is. Father, we thank you for who you are. Yes, Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you for these words, Lord, Mm. of life, encouragement. Lord, may you deposit this deep into our soul. Amen. Into the heart of our very being, that they may become the foundations that we work from. Our hunger, our desperation for you, our need of you. And Lord, let us never, ever take you or one another for granted. Yes, Lord. Mm. For this life is so short on Mm. this earth. Mm. Mm. And the commission you've given to us is to love one another as you loved us. Mm. This day we honor you. We're forever indebted for your word. The words of truth, life that shape our very beings, that shape our lives, that become our covering, our protection in this hour. Lord, and we look forward to this week to come and for the new year that's upon us, Lord, on your calendar. We're excited, Lord, for what you're doing and what's about to be done. And despite we see all the atrocities happening around us, Lord, I know there's a cloud coming. And that's where my focus is. Yes. Thank you. Help us to focus on you in this hour. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all.